Well, good morning. Hey, in going through our study of the book of Romans together, we've been listening to Paul share the gospel, and he's been doing that with us. He's been preaching very hard to us that we are saved by faith, that we are saved by grace, right? It is not because of any work. We are also adopted children of God. Jesus is also the prophesied Messiah. In fact, Romans 10 verse 9 uh, is something that we read every single time we share the plan of salvation at our church. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I like it. It's simple. It's straight to the point. And to be honest, I think Paul is very direct. He, he doesn't sugarcoat it. But at the same time, I don't feel put down when I read this. Paul even tells me that I'm a sinner in Romans 3. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I don't feel put down or belittled when I read that. I mean, yes, I am ashamed of my sin, but I don't feel that Paul is being a jerk about it. And this is one of the things that I think makes Romans so good. So what can I take away from Paul? When it's my turn to share the gospel, how can I be as clear and as loving as he is? Romans 10, 15 says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Today, I wanna to ask you, how do I obtain those beautiful feet? <laughs> because let's face it, Christians, we can come off a little pushy sometimes, like salespeople that are eager to sign someone up for the latest life insurance policy. And when we do that, I think the danger is we can come across as being a jerk. But I never feel like Paul is being a jerk. In fact, quite the opposite. So how do you share your faith in Christ without being a jerk about it? So this morning, instead of looking uh, at a super in-depth, deep dive into Romans 10, let's look at how Paul shares Jesus with others. And I want to essentially do a couple of things. First, I want to share some observations about the culture that we live in, how it's changed over the last 50 years. And I want to share uh, some principles about how to share our faith well. Sound good? All right. So first, our cultural context has changed. It has. You know, I said earlier that many of us who love Jesus can come across as being a jerk when we share the gospel. And I think primarily it's because we just don't understand how much our culture has changed. It's pretty much understood that you and I are now living, living through this last transition of something called modernity to post-modernity. Now, pre-modernity, that was the time during the New Testament when it was written, that's all the way up to about the 1500s. Up to that point, people were illiterate, right? And so if you were given truth or you were giving uh, somebody facts, you would receive those truths or those facts or those teachings from a person, from an authority figure that you trusted. In pre-modernity, you didn't question authority because the authority knew better than you, <laughs> right? They were more educated than you. They could read. So you listened to them. You trusted them. Pre-modernity was uh, the area of kings and bishops and emperors. And truth and power were connected. Modernism grew out of the 1500s, and it basically believed that you could find a reason or an answer for everything. And the events led to the birth of modernism in the 16th century, uh, most notably the invention of the printing press and the rise of science and the Protestant Reformation. Modernism believed that any human wrong could be solved through reason and technology. Modernism was learning focused, and that's when we saw literacy rates shoot way up. And the primary way to communicate truth now was from books. If it was written, it was true, right? Truth was found in books. We trusted books. But the rise of post-modernity is harder to date. Some people believe it started in the 80s. So what changed? Well, post-modernism no longer believes that reason and technology will solve all our problems because 
Technology sometimes creates as many problems as it solves. And postmodernism is also suspicious of reason because it believes that, well, everyone has an agenda, that there are no people that are entirely neutral. In postmodernism, books are out. People with power are out. And the internet is their primary mode of communication. Postmodernism is pluralistic, it's tolerant, and has a belief that there is no such thing as absolute truth. And it focuses more on the individual freedoms. We live in the late transition from modernism to postmodernism, which means there's lots of people that still embrace modernity, but now an ever-increasing number of people who embrace postmodernity. And now we're all waiting to see what's coming next. But I believe this culture shift has an enormous implication for how we share our faith in Jesus. And not understanding these things is often what makes us come across like jerks. For instance, in modernism, outreach was about winning. But today, more churches are succeeding through acts of serving. Back in the day, we said things like, we're going to win the lost. In modernism, outreach was about having a Bible in one hand, teaching Sunday school, and we told all our students, this is a sword, right? This is our sword. Evangelism was about conquest. But today that approach can be very scary to some people. Using military language or imagery can turn a lot of people off. Likewise, a modern church was very program-based. But today, more churches are finding success by being relationship-based. Most of what the Christian church does in America and its regard to outreach and evangelism goes all the way back to a guy named Charles Finney. He lived in the mid-1800s. Finney was an attorney who became a Christian, and basically he viewed effective outreach as just, you just find, you just find the right method, right? Finney was the guy who popularized the altar call, the idea of calling people forward in church to receive Christ. Finney believed if you had an outreach event and no one came to know Christ, it was because, well, you didn't use the right method. And Finney is there, uh, where we get a lot of ideas about evangelism programs, about special meetings, about advertising, a lot more. And back then, it worked. Those programs and events worked because outreach in America used to be about reaching a nominal Christian. Those people back then uh, were born into Christian homes, they had Christian heritages, they understood the Bible, they believed in God, they probably accepted the Ten Commandments. Essentially, churches were reaching out to people who were already religious, but they just hadn't fully given their lives to Christ. But today, effective outreach has to be far more relationship-based rather than being program-based. And this is because a lot of people today are suspicious of big programs, and rightfully so. I mean, if you heard something pitched at you, you would say, sounds great, what's the catch? Right, or sounds too good to be true. Postmodern people have a sort of hidden agenda radar detector <laughs> because they've been targeted all their lives by commercials. And in the end, if we have an evangelism program it just sounds like a commercial to them. Now, I'm not against outreach programs, but the more and more I think about unchurched people and them walking into a church, it's not going to be because of a targeted program. It's going to be because they want to see for themselves what the Christian faith is all about. They don't want to see a show. They, don't want, they want to see what a genuine Christian community looks like which means they're gonna attend as a seeker. And that process is gonna slowly change from them going from a seeker to a believer. It's gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen as fast as one Billy Graham crusade. Outreach today is a process. And that is very different than how most of us were taught to see it. 
The last way I think it's different today is modern outreach used to prove the message was true. But postmodernism wants us to demonstrate that the message is relevant to their life. You see, modernism was about reason, and so Christians had to demonstrate that believing in Jesus was rational. And it focused on things like evidence and facts and arguments and apologetics, all things I like. <laughs> but because of that, we have a lot of great resources, and they show that believing in Jesus is credible, and that approach works great for people that have modern views. But I'm finding more and more people in post-modernity aren't asking whether the faith is true. Because postmodern people are suspicious of people who think they have all the facts. Why? Because they know sometimes facts change. You know, what we used to believe was true is now not practiced. And they're also worried that people have a hidden agenda. And that skews the way facts are presented. Postmodern people don't want to hear the truth about God but they do want to know God, and they want to experience God. And this is why we sometimes come across as jerks, <laughs> because we're approaching outreach as a conquest, program-based, event-orientated, and we're focusing on proving the facts of the Christian faith. But increasingly, today's postmodern people, they're terrified of conquest terminology, and instead they're hungry for an authentic relationship. And they're not concerned with facts or proof, but instead they want to know if the Christian faith is relevant to their life. So, how do we share our faith? I think the book of Romans can help us out. First, I want to remind us what Paul said last week. Remember the anguish he felt in chapter 9. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. We said that Paul felt true anguish and sadness that the people in his community didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And he said, if it were possible, to forgo my own salvation for the sake of other people, I would do it. So the first thing I noticed right away from Paul is he has a genuine concern for his neighbors. Notice how much Paul cares about his lost friends. He loves them. And I would ask, are we just as concerned? Are we just as much in love with non-Christians? All through the 80s and 90s, we were building seeker-sensitive churches. Basically, the seeker-sensitive church tries to reach out to an unsaved person by making the church experience as comfortable, inviting, and as non-threatening as possible. And the hope is that the person will just believe the gospel. The idea behind the concept is to get as many unsaved people through the door as possible, and then, you know, the church leadership, we're willing to use any means necessary to accomplish that goal. This is why there was a rise in churches that used theatrics and musical entertainment to keep the unsaved from getting bored with church, right? Bored with the traditional church. Things like state-of-the-art video technology and lighting and sound, they were all components used by a seeker-sensitive church. But Paul was a seeker-sensitive Christian. Desmond Tutu, a South African bishop and leader in the movement to end apartheid, he said, I don't preach a social gospel. I preach the gospel, period. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is concerned for the whole person. When people are hungry, Jesus didn't say, now is that political or social? He said, I feed you, because the good news to a hungry person is bread. Jesus said in John 13, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. For evangelism to reach the lost, our love has to be genuine. 
without hypocrisy or a hidden agenda. My unchurched friends need to know that I'd love nothing more for them to have a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. But they also need to know that my friendship is not conditional on that. Acts 13 says, For so God has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. What does a light to the Gentiles mean? It means they find you attractive. It means you have beautiful feet. It means if there is an empty seat next to us, or if there is an empty seat in front of us, or if there is an empty seat behind us, that should bother us. But instead, we're bothered if somebody wears a hat to church, or if somebody dresses shabbily, or they're sitting in the pew that we normally sit in, or they brought a child to service and that child was a distraction. Listen, we don't want to become so bothered with introducing new people to faith because we're so focused on enjoying the faith ourselves. We must begin to genuinely care about our neighbors. Second, we can share our faith by praying for our neighbors. That's how chapter 10 begins. Romans 10 says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Paul actually spent time praying for the people in his community who didn't have a relationship with Jesus. He, he wasn't just praying for them as faceless, nameless people in a crowd. He prayed for actual people, family members, friends, former colleagues, neighbors who didn't know Jesus. Where, where are we? Well, we are in Walden Community Church in Montgomery, Texas. Why do we exist? We exist for the people of this community. And you know them. They're your neighbors. They're the people that you play golf with, people that you pick up your kids at school with, the people that you swim with at the pool or play tennis with or eat with. Where do they go to church? What are their thoughts about God? Show some genuine concern for them. And in your discussions, you learn that they don't attend anywhere or that they feel distant from God. You should pray for that person. What should you pray for? Ask God to bless them, to fill their life with God's presence, to fill their life with God's greatness. Pray that God's will is done in their life, for that person to have enriched relationships with their friends and their families. Well, what if I don't know any unchurched people? Well, some Christians find it helpful to do a prayer walk in their neighborhood. I mean, I bet you know a few church members who live around you. Call them up. Say, hey, let's go for a walk around the block. And as you walk, you silently pray for the people and the houses that you see. Maybe you pray for that neighbor across the street that has the really noisy dog, or that family that owns seven motorcycles. Instead of complaining about our neighbors, Let's pray for them. Let's pray for that man whose wife died last year. And you know he's just over there all by himself now. Let me give you a third idea. Let's affirm the things that are good in their life. In modernity, we pointed out that we could point out what was wrong with somebody, right? And we tried to show them that Jesus could fix it. Here's what's wrong with your life. Jesus is the answer. But in Romans 10 too, Paul doesn't say, my Jewish friends were totally wrong. They're so focused on do's and don'ts that they couldn't see the truth in God's grace. No, instead, he affirms something in their lives that they had right, namely their passion for God. He says in Romans 10 too, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, Pastor David, you don't understand my unchurched friends. My, my friends have nothing to affirm, okay? Paul, Paul's talking about religious people here, people who already believe in God and who follow the Ten Commandments. Of course, Paul could find something to affirm in their lives, but I can't find anything positive to affirm in my unchurched friends' lives. 
okay, but it's not just here. You know, there's a story in Acts 17 where Paul goes to speak to the pagans who live up on Mars Hill. He sees all their idols and statues and their false temples, and he says, you stupid idiots! How can you worship these idols made of wood and clay? How dumb can you be? No. He starts off with an affirmation in Acts 17, 22. He says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are religious. Listen, you don't have to be afraid to affirm positive things in other people's lives. It's not an endorsement of their entire life. You're not endorsing their lifestyle. Paul even takes it a step further in the book of Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says, to the Jews I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means, I might save some. Look at that. Paul didn't have that hang up. He freely affirmed what he saw that was positive in their life. And if Paul could find something to affirm in the Athenians, then you and I could find something to affirm in the lives of our unchurched friends. Let me give you another example. We can share our faith by preaching the message. We see this principle in Romans 10, 14, 15. He says, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless someone is sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, let me explain a couple of Greek words here. The first Greek word is the word preaching. In verse 14, uh, we see that. And then when we read it in our America, right, in our American ears, we hear preaching as either something that's negative or something that's scholarly, right? It's preaching is what an educated pastor does, or it's scolding and nagging. If someone's scolding you repeatedly, we would say, stop preaching at me, right? But the Greek word here just simply means announce. It's something that you're doing in public. So what Paul is talking about is very different than what most of us think of as preaching in our culture. Preaching is simply public speaking. The second word is the word sent in verse 15. The Greek word here is apostello. What does apostello sound like? Apostle, right? It's the same word. That just means a sent person. It means to send a person to be an official representation of somebody else, like an ambassador of a country that goes to another country, like a missionary. So who is sent to preach? Is it just pastors? People who've been trained? People who went to seminary? No. Jesus says in John, as the Father sent me, so now I send you. All through Christmas, we read the story and even before Christmas, we were studying Romans. We were telling the good news. What is it? What is the good news? What is the gospel? Simply that God sent his son Jesus to the world. He lived a perfect life to love, to give his life as a sacrificial death on the cross. But it didn't end there. The good news is that he also resurrected from the dead. Christ died for us so that we can be made right with God. The work is done, the debt is paid, and we get to come into God's kingdom. The good news is the backbone of this book, and that is why we are studying Romans. To know this message. To know this truth. Now, I find from this section two important things to keep in mind when it's our turn to share the message. The first is, when we preach, we've got to preach it accurately. When Jesus gives his instruction and his great commission to the church, he says in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. What message do we tell? His commands. His message, right? 
Listen, there's, there's no one right author. There is no one right pastor. There is no one right denomination. There is only one right God. It's his message that we tell, his gospel, his commands. We don't have the liberty to water down the message or to leave out parts if we think the, those people might find it too difficult to understand. We have got to make sure that we're accurately sharing the good news. And second, we preach it positively. That last part in verse 15 is a quote from Isaiah 52 about the messenger's feet. Feet being beautiful. Back then, they didn't have TV or the internet or social media. They had to communicate through an actual messenger. The messengers would come into a community and they would share about what was going on in other places. And you could just tell by looking at the messenger whether it was good news or bad news. A messenger that has a spring to their step and a smile on their face is bringing good news. The phrase beautiful feet is simply a way of saying this messenger was a joy to receive. One more principle. We share our faith by trusting in its power. That's what we see in verse 17. Romans 10, 17 says, So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith is not generated by using the right approach, or hearing the right speaker, or attending the right program. Faith is generated by the message itself, the good news of Jesus Christ. And I think this one is especially hard for us to learn because when we hear the word evangelism or we start talking about sharing our faith, we think it falls on us. You know, I'm not ready to tell others because I don't know it all myself. I wouldn't know what to say. We are too scared to preach because we doubt ourselves. Friends, there is even more good news. Faith comes from hearing the words of Christ. So it's not you. It's not your message. That's not what saves. It's Jesus. And churches do it too. We focus so much on method and program that we neglect the very thing that transforms people. Because if we truly believe that the power is in the message, then we don't have to rely on special techniques or methods or programs or revivals or lights or sounds or video. If we just accurately communicate the good news, the truth of that will change people's lives. I believe that. So there you have it. How to share your faith without being a jerk. And don't be surprised if the church today isn't the same as it was 50 years ago. The world isn't the same as it was 50 years ago. The good news is we don't need programs or ideas that existed that worked 50 years ago because we can follow Paul's example. And that's existed for a thousand years before that. We can reach our neighbors by caring and praying and affirming while we speak and while we trust. Let's pray. Lord, give each one here the assurance and the boldness that they need to share their faith with their unchurched friends, with seekers, with atheists, with agnostics, with the lost. Lord, we pray for each person that is in our life right now that does not know Jesus, whether we know them by name, by face, or where they live, Lord, if there is any way that we can be a light to the lost, if this church, if our life can be that light, Lord, give us that beautiful message. Give us beautiful feet. Show us how to build relationships based on trust and love. Give us a genuine concern for our neighbor that more might know you and more might know your grace. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and worshiping with us uh, this morning. Of course, we'd love to have you here. 
we'd love to invite you to be a part of our community. Uh, we have two services every Sunday, one at 9.30, which is more traditional. It'll probably feel like the church that you grew up in. And then one at 11, which is more contemporary, come casual, come however you, you feel like. Uh, we've got a full program from birth all the way through high school, and we'd love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.